Welcome back, everyone, to another segment of Rabbi Jeff's Pirkei Abashir, where we attempt to understand the meaning behind the instructions of our sages and how it's relevant to our lives today. We do this, of course, using the thoughts of our teachers before us and try to make them applicable to our times. Feel free, please, to contact me with any comments or questions at RJ from LJ at AOL.com. The Pirkei Abbas Podcast is a project of the Intentional Jew Podcast Network, where we actively encourage Jews to think and engage in the search of how to be intentionally Jewish. Check us out on intentionaljew.com. So today's Mishnah, we're, we're rounding out towards the end of the, of the parak, which is amazing. Um, this was the last of the five students of Rabbi Yochanan, um, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, that it was Rabbi Lezer. If you remember, Rabbi Lezer ben Orach was the Mayon Hamizgaber. He was the ever rejuvenating um, spring. And that we had said about him that he had said what was the most, that his Rebbe had said about him that who was he? He was a, a lave tov. He had a, a good heart. He was, and he said, what's the best quality to go into seek in this world is a lave tov, is a good heart. What's the worst is, of course, a lave ra. So we're going to try to fit all that into this Mishnah. Let's take a look at the Mishnah of Rabbi Lazar Benarch. Rabbi Lazar Benarch says, Have you shakud lilmod Torah? That a person should be diligent in their study of Torah. Vida mashetoshiv apikoras. And that he should know what to answer an apikoras. Now, <clears throat> again, we have, we have another one that's telling us about, about learning Torah and that you have to be diligent in learning Torah. And thank you very much. I mean, that sounds to be like the answer of everything. Learn Torah, which I, I understand. It's, it is an important thing. But why is that at the, at the top of the list? So the simple answer, of course, is that because Torah is the center of everything and is the center of a Jew's life. And therefore, you have to straighten out your learning of Torah. But it's not, a, it's not a necessarily an ethical value. So, so what, is the, what is the value? What is he really trying to teach? Plus that you should be, sh- and, and when it says to learn Torah, it doesn't say that you should be low-made Torah. It says that you should be shakud. Shakud, which means for, 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 somehow like diligent. There's something, um, something, something very, uh, very strong about that word shakud, being diligent in the learning of Torah. What do they want from us? Second, vidama shetashiv lapikoris. Know what to answer in apikoris. That's the way I have to learn Torah. I have to learn Torah just to know how to answer an apikoris. No, it's not to learn Torah because that's the center of my life, because I just I have to learn Torah to learn Torah. And wh- why is it important to answer an apikoris? An apikoris is a, you know, an apostate. Why is it important to answer an apostate? And that's the goal of my learning. And what if, my, if, my, if I fail short of that goal, I haven't learned Torah? What happens if I never have an opportunity to even meet an apostate? Because I've just never met an apostate before. And therefore, what I, my, my learning Torah wasn't, wasn't valuable. Plus, do you know that you need to know nothing, really, to be able to argue with an apostate? For two reasons. First of all, if you're dealing with a Jewish apostate, so then you don't need to know anything to argue with them. And the reason you don't need to know anything is because your argument is never going to work. Nothing you say is going to matter to them, because the reason that they have all the questions that they have is because they don't really feel like keeping it. The questions are not real questions because when the questions are real questions, they ask them in a certain way. You know, the, in this past week's parasha by Korach, when Korach asked all these questions to Moshe and he said, you know, if there was a room full, we know that you have to put a mezuzah on the door. And on the mezuzah, there are two parts of the Torah. What happens if you have a room full of Sifrei Torah? You need to put up a mezuzah because the part of the mezuzah is contained inside the Torah. So if you've got a room filled with Sifrei Torah, then what do you need a mezuzah for? Sounds a good question. And then he says to him, you know, you have to put trellis, you have to put blue on the tzitzis of the garment. What happens if your whole garment is made of trellis? Your whole garment is made of blue. Do you need to put tzitzis? Do you need to put blue in your tzitzis? Those are, those are great questions. I think that those are ridiculous questions. The question itself is a good question, but the way that he asked it was not a good question. Because if you wanted to ask a question like that, you would say, hmm, I wonder, what's the reason that we put on trellis? Is the reason we put it on blah? And you would, and you would, you would build this whole thing and then you would be open to what the answer is. He wasn't open to the answer. He was asking a question to challenge and to knock something down. For a person like that, there is no answer. A person who already has decided that there is no God in the world because of the Holocaust, it doesn't matter what you say to them. It doesn't matter the argument you give them. It doesn't matter the rationale that you give them. 
It doesn't matter the way you explain it. Nothing is going to answer them. When a person sees, God forbid, a child die, and then they say, I can't believe in a God that would do such a thing. So that person is, has closed the book, and there's very little you can say that's going to, very little intellectually that you can say that's going to make a difference. So what does it mean that I should learn Torah in order to be able to answer an apicotus? <coughs> that my Torah is not going to help an apicotus. And if we're dealing with a non-Jewish apicotus, or we're dealing with somebody who, let's say, a, a Jews for Jesus, a missionary, you don't need to know anything to answer them. You need to know 15 things. 15 things, because they have, they have a set, almost a set, a series of things that they will prove to you that Jesus is in their Bible, in your Bible. He's in the Old Testament. Then they'll give you this verse, and they'll give you this verse, and then they'll ask you about Isaiah 52. I was once out with my family, and I, I don't know quite a bit of studying about this, because on campus, which I, I worked up on campus, there was a lot of, a lot of missionaries, and, uh, and I would give a lot of classes to the students to give them background to be able to answer up these questions. Because even if you don't have a good Jewish background in learning, you can still answer the questions because the questions are all the same. And there's, there's sort of like set questions, set proofs. So I'm sitting there with my family on Pesach and we're sitting and we're eating, um, we're sitting, we're eating matzah. You know, we get the whole thing decked out. It was in a park. It was in some, some park re remote. It was, it was in Penasquitas, whatever. It was like, it was, it was way out. We were sitting there having a great time. This guy comes over to me and he says, are you Jewish? And I'm thinking to myself, what do you think I am? I'm sitting there eating this cracker on, you know, this, this matzah on, on, on a, you know, the holiday of Passover. Like, what did you think? Okay, fine. So good. So the guy says to me, you're Jewish. He says, can I ask you a few questions? And I'm thinking, great. You know, people like to ask questions of a rabbi. When I go shopping in a supermarket, you know, at home, so it takes me an hour to go through the supermarket when I would just want to go in for one thing, because, you know, you meet people, you know, and they say, Oh, like it's a, it's, you know, it's a free session. Oh, rabbi, you know, can I, and, and whenever people ask questions, so I figure, okay, good. The guy wants to ask questions. No problem. Guy says to me, what do you think about Isaiah 52? I'm saying, you know, it's a nice chapter. I say it's a good guy. So he says, nobody talks about the suffering serpent and, you know, and, and about Jesus. So I said, did you read Isaiah 50, 49? 48? Did you read the rest of the book? I said, just look at the context of where that chapter comes in. And I start to give him an answer. And the guy's face drops. It's like, you're not supposed to know this. And you're not supposed to know more than me. Because I, I asked you the question. And I, you know, in, in 10 seconds, made the guy get very nervous. The guy says to me, oh, thank you very much. And just walks away. You don't need to know anything. I mean, you know, we were once at a rally, a, 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 a rally for Israel in a park. And there was missionaries that were going around the back of the, of the thing. So I, I walked up to them and I, I said, you know, can I help you guys? Oh, yes, you know, we're here to bring the, the light to the world, blah, blah, blah. And then they started to tell me their stuff. And I was able to counter every single one of the things. And it's not because I'm a genius, but because I studied it, because it's not a lot to study. It's not, they're not difficult things. When they talk about, you know, the virgin birth, it's, it's very easy to refute them on the, the virgin birth. The virgin birth is ba based on a verse in Isaiah. But the verse in Isaiah has nothing to do with the virgin birth. The Hebrew word for a virgin that's going to give birth, Mary, supposedly, is Alma. Alma doesn't mean a virgin. Alma just means a young maiden. So their entire theory of the, of, of the virgin birth is actually based on a mistranslation of the Hebrew text, which is an incredible thing. You show this up to them, and they start to stammer. I mean, they get sweaty, and they get all nervous. You don't have to know a lot. So what is the Mishnah telling me that have you shakud lil my Torah? That you have to be shakud to learn Torah? No, you don't. If to, to, in order to be able to answer and not be curious, you don't need to learn diligently. You need to do a little research. That's all. Take you a couple of hours, you'll be able to get the whole thing. Especially nowadays, all you got to do is Google it, and you'll see, you know, these these websites, Jews for Judaism, and and you'll see all the all the responses that you have to give to a missionary. So what is the Mishnah telling me? Have you shakud lil my Torah v'dama shatashu la bikaris? So you know what to answer and not be curious. Then, here we go again. Know in front of whom you, you work, in front of whom you toil, right? You know, know that it's all about God. Well, of course it's all about God, especially when you're sitting there eating matzah on Pesach. You know that this is about God because, you know, there, there's nothing fun about eating all that matzah on Pesach. So, you know, you're doing it because there's a, there's a much bigger reason. So what does it mean? And remember that your Baal Malachtacha, the person that you work for, is going to pay you for the effort that you put into it. What is that? What is that telling me? 
Because please remember, you all remember, from the very beginning of Pirkei Avos, don't serve your master to get a reward. Why do we keep bringing up this reward thing? And having to, you know, to redefine it and say, no, it's not really a reward. Like, what's going on over here? What's the message of this Mishnah? Which, by the way, um, you can do on, on one hand, if you count them. It's actually, again, we have the same problem that we had last Sunday. It was last Sunday. You don't have three, you have four. Have you Torah? Dama Shatasiv Lapikoras, that's two. Dalif Nemiato Amos three, Vinemun Hubalamalach, Shi Shah Mukhaska Pula Sakha, that's four. But we said that Hey Mom Mushla Shadwar, they all said three things. So what's going on over here? Okay, so I think that the key of this Mishnah lies in this Abikoras business. Because why are we bringing up learning Torah to answer up an Apikoras? Why are we bringing up reward and punishment? The fact that there is reward and punishment and that you, um, you, know, that you have to remember that there is reward and punishment. Why are we bringing it up in this Mishnah? Because what is an apikoris? An apikoris, um, there's many, many explanations of what the etymology of the word is. One is from Epicurean. The other is from the word hefke, which means ownerless, which means ultimately, what is the apikoris? The person who is, we call it in English, an apostate, we, we, we identified them earlier in the Mishnah as the, the students of Antignos, which were the Sadducees and the Betuthians, right? The Tzdukim and the Baitusim that came from his discussion when Antignos said, don't be like a servant who serves his master with the hope of, of receiving a reward, but rather serve your master without the hope of receiving a reward. They interpreted that as saying that it means that there's no reward. Less din, less dayan. There's no judgment. There's no justice. There is, there, there is nothing. And therefore, they, they, they broke away and they started their own religion, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. But, but it was all because they thought that there was no reward and punishment, because they thought that that's, what their, that the, that's what their master was telling them, their teacher was telling them, that it doesn't really matter what you do anyway. So an apikoris really ultimately is somebody who ultimately wants to be hefker. He wants to be ownerless. He wants to have no, no real responsibilities and he wants to have no real sense inside of himself that pushes him and motivates him to do what he's doing. You know, one of the complaints that we had against God in the desert was that we said we remembered the melons and the vegetables and the fish that we ate chinom. We ate for nothing in Mitzrayim. What did that mean, they ate for nothing in Mitzrayim? That meant they ate chinam for free without any mitzvahs, no strings attached. That they got the fish and they got the, the watermelon and they got the, the melons and they got the, the, the cucumbers, whatever they were eating, but there was no strings attached. And that's what they pined away for they pined away for a time where there would be no strings attached, no sense of responsibility. What's this apikoris, this person who is hefka, this person who wants to live ownerless, what's he missing? He's missing the knowledge of who, who he's doing mitzvahs for. He sees mitzvahs as an obligation to God. And that the reason that he's doing everything that he's doing is because God wants it and he's doing it for God. And what he doesn't realize is that the reason that he's doing mitzvahs is that it is for his best interest. Mitzvahs are there to guide his life so that he gets the maximum out of life that he gets a chance to develop a relationship with God, that he has an opportunity to be able to live life to the max, to be able to pull out the best and the beauty from the life that he lives. And instead, he sees it as a responsibility to God. When it's about God, it's harder to motivate because this is what God wants. Nobody likes to do what somebody else wants. But this is best for me. That generates such incredible energy. 
when you know that this is going to be better for you, this is going to be something amazing for you. You know what the, the proof of that is? I used to tell my, the teenagers in my shear that to get up, imagine, imagine if I were to tell you, I'm coming to your house at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to bring you to the base medrash. We're going to sit in the base medrash. We're going to learn for a bunch of hours. And then afterwards, we're going to daven. I'll feed you breakfast. And then we'll sit and learn more hours. Yeah, so most of you would say to me, oh, I hope you have a great time, Rabbi. I don't know if I can make it. And, you know, if I'm not there, start without me. But if I were to say to the same teenagers, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm coming to pick you up, and we're going to drive seven hours to Mammoth Mountain, and we're going to go skiing for eight hours, and then we're going to drive back. Are you in? At 2 o'clock in the morning, they'll be messaging me saying, Me, where are you? There's, when you think that it's something that you're going to benefit from, when it's for you, then it's, you have energy for it. When it's something that's for God, much more difficult to motivate, much more difficult to push ourselves. Now, of course, everything we do is for God. We're here in this world because of God. But God created us to give us his goodness, and that is for our benefit, so that we could live a life of fulfillment. We could live a life of beauty. See, these guys, Tzadok and Baitus, they were worried. They listened to their Rebbe who told them that there is no reward, or they thought, he said, there is no reward and punishment. What they, what they assumed was that there, is no, that there is no ultimate reward and punishment. So what did they do? They started their own religion. And what was their religion? They dropped the oral Torah and they accepted the written Torah. Now what you need to understand is that they couldn't have dropped the oral Torah completely because the, there was no way to keep the written Torah without the oral Torah. In other words, they, even if they dropped the, the oral Torah, they would still have to have certain explanations because there's no explanation of what tefillin is, what a mezuzah is, you know, what, what, what matzah is, what any of the shechita, like any of the things that we do, there's no explanation for it. So there definitely was uh, they had to, if they were living Jewishly on any level, they had to have some amount of oral Torahs. So what was it that they were dropping? What was it that they were dropping was that as far as they were concerned, the places where the oral Torah argues with the Torah itself, for example, the Torah says that where do you have to put your tefillin on your head? You have to put it between your eyes. Now, the rabbis come along and say, it doesn't really mean between your eyes, it means on top of your head. So they looked at that and they said, but wait a second, but it says in the Torah, the text says it's got to be between your eyes. Now for them, their problem was, is that if the rabbis could say that it's meant to be over here, if the rabbis can define things, if the rabbis can look at things in the Torah and they can define them, not just pass down a tradition of this is what they are, the tefillin are black and the tefillin are square, but then to say that, no, the Torah says over here, but we're going to say that it's over here, if the rabbis have the ability to do it, that means that God gave the rabbis the ability to be able to make those laws. And if the rabbis have the ability to make those laws, that means that the whole purpose of this Torah is for man to live by it, that it's really what's best for him. Because if it wasn't, so then God would never give over the ability to be able to make these kinds of monumental decisions. He never would have given them over to the rabbis, never would have given them over to people. You know, somebody who owns a store is not going to turn to his employees and say to them, listen, guys, ma make any decision. Figure out what, how much you want to charge for things. You guys can decide when you want to open, when you want to close. Unless he totally trusts that person, he says to that person, look, it's really, you know, you're making the money off of this. I want you to make those decisions. If a person's child, if a person's son or daughter is running the store, then they would be comfortable saying to them, look, you make those decisions. Clearly what it means, if God gave this over to the hands of the rabbis, if Loba Shemaimi, if the Torah doesn't live in heaven anymore, and it lives in the hands of the people, that the people, we have to make it a living Torah. Our job is to make these mandates, to make these laws and rules in order to be able to make it a living Torah. That means 
that God is giving it to us. And he says, you got to live by this. Make it best for you. Make it work for you. Make a law called muktza on Shabbos, that you can't touch something so that you don't come and transgress the, the main law of Shabbos, which is not to do the, the particular prohibited work. But do that. You figure out what's best for you. You figure out the way to make it a living Torah. Because ultimately, who is this Torah for? Ultimately, it's for you. It's not for me, says God. It's not, you're not doing this for me. You're doing this for you so that you can, you can elevate your soul. You can build a relationship with me. You can maximize your life here, but it's ultimately for you. That Stuki doesn't want it to be for him. That Stuki doesn't want to have that kind of responsibility. That Stuki doesn't want to have that feeling of, you know what, I'm not, I got him doing this for God because I'm doing this for me. Because as long as that Stuki feels he's doing this for God, he can be lazy about it. It's for God, it's not for me. Okay, I don't really have such a great relationship with God anyway. I don't really, I don't feel, I don't feel like I need to motivate myself. There's, and as long as he can say that there's no reward and punishment, it doesn't really matter anyway. Okay, fine. I don't have, I don't have this great feeling about God. I'm not really that motivated. If it's about me, then how can I not be motivated? Because who, who wouldn't want to do something good for themselves? And therefore, if that's the case, the Tzuki felt that God owes me. If I'm doing it for God, God owes me. And if God is not going to pay me, if there's no reward, then you know what? I'm out of here. I don't, I have no, there's nothing, there's nothing motivate me because really I feel that God owes me because I'm doing it for him, doing it for myself, doing it for what's best for me. I don't want that responsibility. I don't want that because I know by definition that's going to motivate me. That's going to push me. And that's what the Mishnah is saying. The Mishnah, which was said by Elizabeth Arach, who told us that we have to have an emotional connection to Judaism, who was a mayon hamizgabru, was like a spring that was ever rejuvenating, like somebody who was so, his heart was into it, so he was seeing new things every day. He turns to us and he says, Heavy shakud lilmot Torah. That's not just saying that you have to learn Torah. The word shakud, being diligent, really comes from the word shkedim, comes from the words amens, to blossom. The Torah has to blossom. It has to grow. It has to, be with, it has to be from your heart. It has to be with your total engagement and involvement. It has to be with your enthusiasm. You have to be emotionally involved in your learning, that it's something that's so dear and precious and special to you. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to slap the Apikoris in the face. Because the Apikoris says, it doesn't matter. It's not, it's not good for me. It's good for God. There's no, I have no emotional attachment to this. And when he watches somebody who has emotional attachment, that's his answer. Dude, the reason why this is not something important to you is because you're not emotionally attached to it. Because you're completely disconnected from it. You're doing it as a paying dues to some greater power called God. And you're not doing it because you understand that this, that God cares about you and gave you something that's the best for your life. And therefore, you know, you don't have that, that enthusiasm, that emotional attachment to it. It's because you're doing it for the wrong reason. That's why you're not emotionally attached to it. You want to answer him? Don't say a word to the Apikoras. Don't engage him in, in any conversation. You'll never be able to answer him. But you'll be able to be a mirror that's going to show him in his face. This is what happens when you're emotionally involved. And that's going to be the answer to the Apikoras. That's going to be the cure to his hefkerus, to his desire to, to, to detach himself. How do you do that? You have to make sure that you understand and you keep straight exactly what you're doing. Vidalif miata omel. That you know that you're working for God, in, in, you're working in God's world. God gave you this world. God created this world. And he said to you, make the best out of this. And that you're toiling inside of God's world to find the best for yourself, to find the way to improve yourself, to make yourself in the best that you can be. And understand that in the end, God is going to pay you He's going to reward you for the things you do. That's not reward and punishment. But that means that if you follow these rules, it's going to pay off. 
It's going to pay off for you because you're going to be the best you can be. And that ultimately is going to give you the ultimate reward of attachment to God, of a feeling of connection to God. But you have to keep it straight. You have to make sure that you understand who this is for, that this is for your life, that this is to become the best that you can be. And you have to be emotionally involved, emotionally engaged in it, not disconnected, not looking at it from the outside saying, yeah, it's something for some higher power. No, it's for you. It's for your best. It's for your advantage. That's why we keep mitzvahs. And that ultimately, what is your advantage? It's not that you're going to make money off of this, but that it's going to give you godliness. It's going to attach you to godliness. If you keep that straight, so then you will be, your life will be, will be that much better your connection to mitzvahs and ultimately connection to God, there will be a fulfillment and a meaning in your life. There will be a purpose for your existence. And that's what Rabbi Laza teaches us. Rabbi Laza ben Arach tells us that we have to be emotionally engaged in the things that we do. We, the way to be emotionally engaged is to recognize who's it, who it's for. It's for our good. It's for our purpose. It's the, yes, God's involved, but God is the one who gave us this, who directed us this way, how to live our lives to the max. Okay.